Okay, Andrew. Okay, thank you. All right, um, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce this week's speaker. We have Aaron Muller from Mount Marine Lab. And um, unfortunately, she didn't make it to campus uh, today because she was out in the field just yesterday. And so um, she's balancing all of her various roles. And I'll just start by introducing her as um, she has now um, assumed the role of Associate Vice President for Research at Moat Marine Lab. And she is program manager for two different programs. One is on coral health and disease and the other on coral restoration. And I think what really makes Erin so special and why I was interested in bringing her on um, to speak to us today is she's really a scientist and a practitioner. I think it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like a dual sort of role or mission that many of us um, in the seminar strive for in our own work, but she's actually managed to do it and balance it and excel at both. Um, she's been recognized um, with a number of awards, including um, Young Scientist of the Year Award from the International um, Coral Reef Society, and also with a, more recently, a Presidential Early Career Award for Science and Engineering. Um, and so, that's just recognition for the amazing work that she's done. She's managed to grow um, two very strong programs at Moat um, during her relatively short time in the um, leadership roles there. And I can just say that I have personally, um, or my research program has benefited from my association with Erin. She supported us directly and indirectly in our own collaborative research that we based in part out of Moat. And so I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. Erin's um, had a tremendous influence. And I think my experience working with her and with Moat is just um, one small example out of a constellation of collaborations that, um, that Aaron um, leads and manages. So um, um, without further ado, I wanna um, just allow her to, uh, to take the floor and she's gonna be sharing with us um, some of her own kind of experience and, um, and lessons learned from the work that she does. Thank you, Aaron, for coming in today to uh, speak to us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be able to share your lunchtime with me. Um, and hopefully you can see everything in presentation mode now. Yep, yeah, we can see her and I'm just, um, actually, hold on a sec. Yes, I think we should be able to see it among different things, but why don't you go ahead and get started. All right, so hopefully most of you can see my title slide. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to share with you quite a bit of what my lab kind of directly has been up to, but also this presentation really represents like 30 to staff members at Moat that focus in one way or another on coral reef research and restoration. So it really is a testament to the amazing amount of people and infrastructure and staff we have at both that are focused on coral reefs. Um, so just to give you kind of an overview of where we're going today, I'm going to start off just by getting us all on the same kind of playing field a little bit about coral reefs and why organizations like Moat focus a lot of infrastructure and people power on coral reef ecosystems and just to get everybody up to speed a bit on Florida's coral reef and the status of this important resource we have within our state. Um, because my foundational work is really focused on coral disease dynamics, I spent some time talking about stony coral tissue loss disease, which is the largest disease outbreak ever recorded in history affecting corals. And it is uh, still very much a problem today. And then we'll move into some of the coral resilience work that I've been uh, focusing on over the last several years, looking at how you to increase resilience associated with restoration activities. And then I'll introduce some of our large-scale collaborative restoration research projects that I think are the forefront for novel investigations into restoration science moving forward. Sorry, we're not seeing presentation mode. Um, if you're changing slides, we don't see it. Okay. Um, we still see the PowerPoint view with the slides on the side. How about now? All right, yeah, that's good. Okay, so now you should have seen it advance to the next slide. 
Yep. Yeah. That looks good. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys. All right. So why do we care so much about coral reefs? I think it's really important to kind of set the stage as to why these ecosystems are so valuable. They're the most biologically diverse ecosystems in the world and the marine environment and really rival uh, rainforests on land. Um, and it's estimated that 25% of marine life rely on coral reefs during one stage or another in their lifespan. So that ecosystem is incredibly important to maintain that biological diversity within our oceans. But these reefs also provide ecosystem services. So uh, direct benefits that humans take advantage of almost on a daily basis. In Florida, one of the most important ones is that our reef tract, which goes from Martin County on the East Coast all the way down to the Dry Tortugas, helps to protect our shoreline by absorbing wave energy. So as large waves and storms come in, all of our infrastructure that's near that shoreline environment actually gets protected because of the wave attenuation that occurs when those storms come through. The waves break on the reef, and so there's less energy hitting directly against our shorelines. Also, coral reefs and organisms found within this ecosystem are a source for novel compounds to fight diseases, and already we're sourcing compounds to fight things like cancer and drug-resistant bacteria, and even methods to help uh, reduce the impacts of Alzheimer's. And finally, just kind of holistically looking at the world, about a billion people rely on reefs for food, postal protection, their cultural practices and income. So a lot of people's food security and income security really rely on reef ecosystems. Now to take it more home, Florida's coral reef are a huge economic driver and the foundation of much of our ecotourism, especially in places along the East Coast and into Monroe County. The reefs help to attract over 16 million visitors to our state each year, support over 70,000 local jobs, and are estimated to be worth at least $8 billion to the state economy. And I mentioned before that the um, reefs themselves protect our shorelines and annually that helps to reduce costs associated with flood mitigation almost by a million dollars a year. So incredibly important for our infrastructure protection. And just to kind of get an idea of what corals are all about, they're actually really complex organisms. And if you go to the reef structure, Florida's Coral Reef, and actually like hammer down into the physical structure of the reef, reef is made of coral skeletons. So they truly are the foundation of our reef tract. And those corals are an animal themselves, but they have a really close association with a couple different microbes. One in particular are bacteria. So the bacteria within the coral tissue and on the surface of the coral provide a lot of um, protection against pathogens, antibiotic production, and even nutrient cycling. And then the algae, the, symbio uh, the symbiodiniaceae that live inside the coral tissue provide the corals their color. But more importantly, they provide corals with a lot of food in the source of carbon, and um, are all of these kind of organisms working together are part of the coral holobia. And you have to really understand each one in order to kind of think about coral, coral health, coral physiology, and those implications when you're doing things like large scale restoration. Now, unfortunately, Coral cover has been on the decline for at least the last 50 years. So this is a meta-analysis conducted by Gardner in 2003 that really looks at the entire Caribbean, but this could basically be a, a picture associated with Florida's coral reef as well, where the beginning coral cover 50 years ago was around anywhere between 30 and 50% on average. And over time, you see these stepwise declines associated with coral cover because of mortality. And these stepwise declines are, are because of pretty dramatic events. The first big decline was in the late 70s, early 80s, and it was associated with one disease, white band, which affected the elkhorn and staghorn coral primarily. But these were the two most common species in shallow water reefs environments for the last 200,000 years. So the fact that this disease wiped out over 50% of the coral cover the testament to how dramatic this particular outbreak was. 
Since then, we've only seen further declines associated with climate change, really warm waters, and El Nino events that result in corals becoming stressed, losing their symbiodiniaceae and starving to, get to death because of that, or becoming more susceptible to additional diseases. And now since kind of that outbreak and over the last several decades, there's been many different types of coral diseases that have been identified. And unfortunately they're becoming pervasive and, and prevalent in many places like Florida. And I think you'd be kind of hard pressed to go to a reef and not see at least one of these issues affecting corals today, unfortunately. So because of all that, Coral reefs around the world and, and definitely kind of at ground zero in Florida, they are functionally dying. So all of those, you know, hard stony corals that you see in this image from Curie's Fort Reef, which is in the upper Florida Keys in the 80s, where you have those staghorn and elkhorn corals dominating that reef area, they are basically lost. And we are now left with skeletons of corals past with reefs really dominated by algae, sediments, and bare substrates. There's even some uptake in some of the gorgonians, which are the soft corals and the sea fans, but those really don't provide those ecosystem services that I mentioned earlier. Long-term data since that meta-analysis has shown uh, one important thing, that there has been no signs of ecosystem recovery over the last several decades. Um, and that's that black line that I just kind of highlighted there. So this is long-term data collected by FWC and showing that there's basic stasis at 5% coral cover um, since the 1990s with no sign of, of an uptick, even though we've had some really significant protection in place in the form of the National Marine Sanctuary. So now enters stony coral tissue loss disease. So stony coral tissue loss disease is one of our biggest current forcing functions, driving last vestiges of corals into regional extinction. It began in 2014 off the coast of Miami and has since spread throughout the entire Florida reef tract and is now into the dry tortugas, although this map doesn't show that um, current time series. It affects over 20 different coral species, mainly the boulder and grain corals that weren't susceptible to the white man disease that affected the branching corals. Interesting, the acroporids, those branching corals, aren't susceptible to this disease outbreak. Um, five of these species are already listed under the ESA. And so this is, you know, potentially, uh, potentially putting the nail in the coffin for some of those species within the region. The pathogen could be bacteria, a virus, or a combination of the two. And there's extensive working groups in place trying to figure this all out right now. So because of stony coral tissue loss disease, we now at our about and coral cover. Um, and this is basically resulting in reefs that are providing those ecosystem services and not harnessing the biodiversity that we really expect of healthy coral reef ecosystems. So because a lot of my research in the lab has um, focused on disease dynamics, um, and the impacts of disease on corals over the last decade or so when stony coral tissue loss disease began, I really uh, shunted a lot of my time into understanding and when this disease occurred. And um, I conducted a spatial analysis to look at the location and timing of the disease spread throughout the Florida reef tract over time. And although this kind of seems like it should be a no brainer, um, a lot of coral diseases in the past have not necessarily been highly contagious. They seem to be related to environmental conditions and genetic susceptibility, but this disease is highly contagious. Um, so the clustered spatial temporal pattern shows a contagious mode of transmission. It also appears to be waterborne. This was um, evidenced by some laboratory experiments that we conducted in our lab, but also uh, other labs throughout Florida have also confirmed that as well. And we showed that this disease can be systemic within the colony, meaning that even if you take a coral and isolate the lesion, other parts of the coral will manifest disease signs and potentially die over time. And I've been working with some hydrodynamic modelers to 
look at how hydrodynamics could influence the spread of the disease among reefs. And it does show that um, the disease front actually can be predicted by just looking at hydrodynamics alone. So the water currents are moving the disease throughout the reef and neutrally buoyed particles actually provide the best predictions of that spread. So something within the water column, not on the top, not on the bottom necessarily, something suspended in the middle is likely the vector that's moving it from one reef to another. We also started diving into the microbiome. So I mentioned how important those bacteria can be in providing resources for the coral. Obviously they can also be pathogenic. So we're really interested in how the microbiomes of these sick corals appeared in, in comparison to healthy corals to see if there is a bacterial pathogen, maybe we can start focusing our effort on some of those major players. Uh, so we've had a few different publications comparing the bacterial community on the diseased lesions, which are the DLs in these, this diagram, the apparently healthy tissue on diseased colonies, which is the DU, and then comparing it to completely healthy corals as well. And so we see some interesting outcomes that have been also replicated in other labs, um, you know, showing that the bacterial community within the diseased coral is significantly different from healthy tissue on diseased uh, corals and also the healthy corals completely, uh, which isn't too surprising because you, even with mortality, you're going to get these secondary um, infections of bacteria in there. And when we look at the relative abundance of the different communities, this is a little bit difficult to digest. Each of these three, uh, pair, three um, tripartites of bars represents a different coral species where the bar on the left is the lesion, then the unaffected tissue and the healthy. But the take home method message here is we often see more of the orange color in the lesions and also more of the purple color, the dark purple color in those lesions. And so we, when we kind of dive into what bacteria are driving those trends, we see that in every species we've analyzed so far, we see an uptick in two bacterial groups, the clostridias and the rhodobacters. Um, so these are probably important players in the manifestation of the disease. Maybe they're primary pathogens. They could likely also be secondary infections that can be important in maybe causing the tissue loss, but not very, not being the primary pathogen, but it helps hopefully move us into a more focused direction to try to figure out what these bacteria may be doing and how we could potentially utilize this information to um, prevent the disease from spreading or prevent it from occurring in the future with new, uh, new disease outbreaks. Part of our research too has also tried to uh, integrate methodologies to treat corals with diseases. So actually as part of my original postdoc here at Moat, I started working with one disease called yellow band in St. Croix. And we tried a couple different methods like shading the coral, and aspirating and removing the lesion tissue and creating fire breaks. And we got some good evidence to suggest that isolating the disease using a fire break was effective in reducing the spread of the disease. And contemporarily, a lot of groups have been looking at ways to treat stony coral tissue loss disease too. So a group from Josh, Voss, Josh Voss's lab and also Karen Neely and Brian Walker from NOVA have been working with a group called Ocean Alchemists to develop an ointment that you can actually um, add amoxicillin to and apply that directly to the disease lesion. And they've done a lot of great studies to show that uh, the amoxicillin itself is really effective 80% of the time in stopping the lesion from progressing, although secondary lesions can occur in other parts of the colony, perhaps because of that um, work that we showed before suggesting that this disease can be systemic. However, there's some risks associated with using um, antibiotics in the marine environment. Um, definitely some other organisms that could be interacting with these um, ointments. And so I was really interested in, you know, trying to play around with some other options with ocean alchemists. And we've been working with them in the U.S. Virgin Islands, where this disease unfortunately has spread to, to test um, non-antibiotic, antiviral, and antibacterial formulations. So these are more like antiseptic applications rather than an antibiotic. Um, and so they've termed them coral cure D and 
coral cure, oh, sorry, coral cure 2D and 3D. And those are the ointments on the right um, that are kind of like this blackish, grayish paste that you get to apply to the coral lesion. So we've tried this in a few different species, a few different locations, and have definitely gotten some mixed results. So this is basically looking at a purple, which is the control or untreated lesions against the 2D in the green and the 3D in the orange. And this is looking at average lesion progression rate over time. Um, and what I wanna point out is that in three of the cases, uh, we actually did see a significant reduction in the progression of this lesion compared with controls, but that wasn't always the case. And it seemed to be site and species specific. So there's still quite a bit of work to do to try to formulate something like this that's going to be as effective as an antibiotic. But it's important to note that that antibiotic right, focuses on bacteria, which again suggests that there is a major role of bacteria in the progression of the lesion. Um, and so that's helping to guide research moving forward quite a bit. So I wanna move next into some of the coral resilience work that I've been focusing on, um, looking at why certain corals are resistant to things like heat or disease and trying to integrate thermal tolerance into our restoration practices to kind of climate proof them as much as possible moving forward. So some of the work I did, gosh, a long time ago, <laughs> with a lot of observations on corals in the water. And that really has led to some of my kind of research focuses today. So what you're looking at here are two different Elkhorn corals that I used to check on every single month for years. Um, we call them Gen 1 and Gen 2 in this in here. And they look very similar in this picture because they're in these like very healthy conditions. Um, but in the summertime, um, when I was monitoring them one year, I noticed that they had a very different phenotype. Uh, they actually responded very differently to very warm water temperatures. So the temperature increased maybe like two degrees above what normal, uh, that's two degrees Celsius, um, above normal summer conditions. And I could see that there was this different physiological response where the genet on the right it bleaches and spits out its symbiont. Um, and the one on the left has these like white patches of tissue loss, but has maintained most of its coloration. And this can obviously have really important implications for downstream survival is that Jenna on the, on the right largely dies because of that bleaching event. Whereas the one on the left like has regained all of its color and it can actually heal over those patches. So when we're kind of thinking about, you know, restoration, we're like, oh, wow, we want that coral on the left, like represented within our brood stock, maybe not as much as the one on the right. So this has led uh, some of my research trying to focus on different genotypes that we have in propagation, and I'll kind of get into our restoration activities next, but we have lots of different genotypes that we raise within restoration context, and I'm very interested in understanding which genotypes are going to be more resistant to some of the major threats like disease, high water temperature and ocean acidification, um, because we know that no matter what, these issues are going to be pervasive for the next several decades, no matter, no matter what societal changes happen today. So it's something that we have to like integrate into a lot of our restoration plans. So one of my first studies was really to find a bio biomarker of disease resistant, of disease resistance associated with these staghorn corals on the right. Um, and it, as I mentioned earlier, white band disease was a disease that really wiped out much of this population and it's still present within our system. You know, it's like an endemic issue. So I focused on understanding white band disease dynamics on these different genotypes of corals to see if there was a reason why some of them seem to be resistant compared with others. And so what I did was take some of the corals that we had in propagation and expose them to tissue homogenates created from sick corals. Basically you can expose the coral and then see the disease signs start to manifest within a couple of days if the genotype was susceptible. And I did this um, for about 15 different genets that we had in propagation. Uh, prior to any stress events, so under natural kind of happy, healthy conditions to look at their baseline levels of resistance. 
And also I did the same study after these corals had gone through a temperature stress event and were bleached. So what you're looking at here are these caterpillar plots. Each dot represents the median risk of disease for each genotype. So the horizontal line is a different genotype that I tested. And basically that a vertical line of one means that there's no signs that occurred whatsoever. And so as the line kind of spans equitably on both sides, they were resistant to the disease. And the more the line resides on the right, the more susceptible they were to the disease. So we can kind of characterize these different relative risks among every genotype before a, a stress event and then after a stress event. And the key outcomes of the study for me were really associated with these two genets, uh, genet three and seven. So they were very resistant to the disease regardless of um, their previous environmental exposure. And so I wanted to know like why. So one, one thing I knew was that all these corals had the same symbiodinium, the same symbiote type. We actually don't have variation within this staghorn coral. And so I knew that that probably wasn't a major driver, but the other component within their um, holobiont are the bacteria. So I've been working with um, Dr. Grace Klingis and Dr. Dr. Becky Dr. Dr. Thurber to dive into the bacterial communities of these different genotypes. And this is a profile of a relative abundance of the different types of bacteria found within most of the corals that I studied. And you can see it's just dominated by this green color, this aquarchetia. Now the aquarchetia is a, not, a, not, a, not a great bacteria to find in your corals. It's actually an uh, obligate intracellular parasite that lives in the coral tissues. And it seems to be highly prevalent and pervasive. What was super interesting was the two disease resistant genotypes had very low prevalence of this aquarchetia, had many other different types of bacteria, so they're highly diverse. And they just retained this bacterial signature, whether they were disease or whether they were um, kind of not stressed or stressed. So for me, this was an important biomarker potentially of the disease resistance within these genotypes. And recently we started um, looking at where this aquarchetia could be coming from. Is it coming from a parent? Is it coming from the environment? And it does appear that it is not vertically transmitted. It is coming from the environment some way or another. So we're trying to figure out like, where is it coming from and why is it infecting all of our corals? And we started screening other corals that we have within propagation to look at whether there's other corals out there that have this low aquarchetia composition. And we did indeed find more these are all corals that we have in our nursery, but that were sourced from different regions. So the lower keys, the middle keys or the upper keys region. And you can see that there are a handful of these corals within the lower keys. Two of them of those handful are the three and seven I mentioned, and there was a few more. And then there's a few from the upper keys. Um, and so now we can start like diving into those genotypes to see if they are also disease resistant to you know, confirm our hypothesis that this is marker that we could use to further identify corals that may be more ad advantageous to outplant more or to integrate into restoration more thoughtfully. Um, and so this is kind of like where a lot of our research is going. Now we're also looking at whether or not disease resistance can be passed on to offspring. So we have a really strong coral reproduction team led by Dr. Hannah Cook, and she's actually grown our disease susceptible and disease resistant genotypes to be reproductive and have crossed them um, comparatively. So you can kind of like look at genotype three as a mom or a dad, and then cross them with susceptible or other resistant genotypes. And now we have cohorts of their babies that we are going to be testing to see if they are disease resistant and if parents can pass that resistance onto their offspring. Because if they can, then that's a great tool to increase genetic diversity, but also increase things like disease resistance within restoration planning. So I've also been looking into heat tolerance and resistance to ocean acidification, again, focusing on the staghorn corals initially because they're really easy to work with. Um, so another study I have conducted was basically a two month long exposure study 
looking at about 20 different of these genotypes and how they responded to high temperatures in ocean acidification conditions in isolation and in concert. So looking at each of those threats individually and then what they look like when they're exposed together and then look for potential trade-offs among these phenotypes. So we don't wanna like, you know, potentially uh, get a heat tolerant coral that's super susceptible to ocean acidification, for example, or at least we wanna understand if that is the case and how to integrate that into our planning. Um, so I wanted to kind of characterize these conditions and how several different genotypes responded. We measured 12 different phenotypic traits, traits associated with the whole coral holobiont, uh, traits associated with just the coral animal and traits with the symbiont. And we plotted them and just showed that the combined ocean acidification and temperature conditions just a vastly different physiological response compared with the other um, treatments that we expose these corals to. And when we looked at individual traits, we could actually see that these responses were synergistic. So if you look at the figure on the left, this is just looking at one trait, buoyant weight, which is like a metric for growth. And so obviously a very important trait for corals, especially when you're thinking about restoration and ecosystem functions. And you can see how there's a reduced growth rate under high PCO2 conditions, which is the OA conditions, and also under the high temperature conditions. Um, but those were pretty equitable when you compare with each other. When you look at those two threats combined, um, the reduction in the growth is actually greater than the sum of those two parts independently. And that's what's displayed with the figure on the right. You uh, have the gray bar that's basically lower than the black horizontal line. It suggests that these threats are working uh, synergistically to greatly reduce the growth rate in this example, more so than if they were kind of independently working on their own. So this can have really important consequences when we're thinking about how these threats can affect our population that we have remaining within the reef tract. And then finally, to look at the trade-offs between heat tolerance and resistance to ocean acidification, I took each trait and looked at how the genotypes grew under those conditions, so under the control conditions, the OA conditions, the high temp and the combined, and I correlated them using a correlation matrix. So compared to those growth rates under those different conditions for all the genotypes. What you're looking at here is the uh, result of those correlation matrices. And the coloration of the circles indicates whether it was a positive correlation or a negative correlation. And if there's an X on the circle, it means that there was some positive associations, but not significant. So no X is there would mean that they were significant. So some of the take home messages here is that there were some positive associations that we did see, but nothing incredibly significant. And when we look at all 12 of those phenotypes that we measured, kind of just like taking this whole thing in, you see a lot more blues than you do anything with reds. You see no significant negative correlations between these traits under the different conditions. And you do see some significant correlations. So this suggests that there are some shared associations in these traits among the genotypes that we're growing, that there's no identified trade-off that we can detect between heat tolerance and resistance to ocean acidification. And then if you kind of throw this back into the disease resistance mix that I've done in the past, those corals that were disease resistant don't seem to have any type of, you know, predictive value, whether they're heat tolerant or, or resistant to OA. So a lot of these associations seem to be either positive or independent. And so far, I haven't detected any negative trade-offs associated with the work I've done with these staghorn corals. So now let's dive into the restoration work that MOAT has been doing and some of the large-scale collaborative restoration projects. So because of the lack of recovery in the Florida Reef Tract, over the last several decades, even though we have strong uh, protection in place in many regions, MOAT decided to invest in understanding and learning best practices for propagation, focusing on the staghorn corals. About 10 years ago, we started our first in-water staghorn coral nursery, which are made of these underwater trees. Each of these trees represents lots of, about 100 different fragments of the same genotype. 
and each tree could have multiple, like you could have multiple genotypes of a tree, but you don't have multiple genotypes within a tree. So now we have about 20,000 staghorn fragments that we grow in our offshore nurseries, which are located off of Summerlin Key and off of Key West with about 200 different genotypes that we have in propagation. Basically any wild staghorn corals that existed that exist in the lower keys and the middle keys we have in curation. And so there's very few genotypes actually in the wild to get. So that's why we're, we have 200. That's about what we're going to max out at without additional sexual reproduction efforts. We outplant about 20,000 of these staghorn corals to the degraded reefs of Florida's retract each year. Um, and when we outplant them, we have kind of honed our methodology so well that we get really good survival after one year. So we do monitoring at one month after outplanting and then one year after outplanting, and then also at three years and five years. And I'll show you an example of that a little later on. To outplant, we actually go up to the tree, take a snip of a little branch off of one of the colonies, keeping the base of the colony on the tree to regrow for broodstock. And we take five uh, branches from the same tree to outplant in what we call monoclonal clusters. So we do clusters of five for staghorn coral, basically take a masonry nail, hammer that into the reef, attach the coral to the masonry nail. It'll grow over the attachment device, over the nail and attach to the reef substrate. And then it will grow and fuse within about eight months. And when we get those corals to grow and fuse, they get to be about a basketball size coral which is important because corals reproduce based on size, not age. And that size is about the size that this species needs to be in order to produce eggs and sperm. So we try to hit that benchmark within a year after outplanting and we do so really well and we have really good survival. Now, we also don't wanna focus on one mono species restoration effort. So um, we've started integrating other really important species like the boulder corals, which are some of the reef building corals and elkhorn coral. Boulder corals were kind of left out of a lot of the restoration practices begin in the early on stages because they grow so slowly, only a couple millimeters a year sometimes. And so they've kind of been left to the side because it's difficult to see progress within a short period of time for those types of species. Um, but some of our scientists and practitioners um, through trial and error and some really advantageous kind of accidents stumbled on the process of microfragmentation and fusion. So microfragmentation is taking a larger coral or even a coral fragment, like what you see here. This is kind of an underwater view of one of our raceways with uh, individual fragments of corals on ceramic box. And each of the circles within each coral represents a polyp. You can actually cut that coral down to an individual polyp and then reattach it onto a new substrate. So that's what we do. We take like a bandsaw, we cut the pieces down into really small fragments and then reattach them onto a new ceramic disc. And when we compare kind of the growth rates of our micro fragments, those of the same initial surface area kind of kept intact, we can see under really ideal conditions, you can get up to 50 times faster growth rates associated with it. So it actually shunts a bunch of resources into creating biomass and tissue, which is how we can create a lot of corals to go out onto the reef within a short period of time, even for these slow growing boulder species. Um, so we outplant them in a similar way with monoclonal clusters, but we take the ceramic disks and we attach them to the reef substrate and the fusion is basically the corals growing out over the substrate, touching each other, fusing, and then growing up or out into those reproductively viable corals. These species take about two to three years to hit that reproductive um, capacity, uh, but it's still much faster than kind of leaving these corals up to their own devices, which could take about 20 to 30 years. So our land-based coral nursery on Summerland can contain about 30,000 coral fragments at any given point in time. And we have thousands of genotypes from about 17 different species that we propagate using this method. And we outplant right now about 15,000 of them per year. And I mentioned we have the really good 
initial success, and we're just starting to capture some of our three-year and five-year data. This is one really nice showcase reef that had absolutely like zero coral on it, eastern dry rocks, um, until 2016 when we started out planning there. Um, and you can see now just kind of the thickets of cervicornis that are there because of our restoration efforts. This actually has translated to a 90% survival rate three years later and a 700% increase in coral cover. Um, so, you know, this is a viable method in the short term and long term. And we do anticipate getting some of those five and 10 year data online in the next couple of years as well. Now, we know that just bringing corals back, um, hopefully, will have trickle effects to other reef ecosystem communities, to the complexity, and to the recruitment that that reef can have. Um, but we don't want to just assume that that's all we need to do. So we are starting to measure the effects associated with our restoration on other community members, like fish assemblages, carbonate budgets, basically the net accretion rates, um, things like fish parasites, where we have these really nice outplanted sites with, paired with non outplanted sites. And we are just starting to capture some of those metrics that we're hopefully providing by just putting corals out there. And we also are integrating the 3D photogrammetry method to get things like rugosity and um, accretion rates through time to look at things like niche space and habitat that we hopefully should be creating by just putting corals out there. And then we also hope to put ourselves out of a job. So what we wanna do is outplant the corals, get them to start reproducing and uh, releasing the eggs and sperm into the water column and then settling back down so that they can kind of have the positive feedback loop. So we're looking to see whether that's happening now. And then obviously we have some bottlenecks to overcome because the habitat is relatively degraded. So there's a lot of algae, there's a lot of sediments. So we need to think about ways to mitigate or reclaim the habitat so that if those corals are not now settling, we can encourage them to do so in the future. So we're trying to think like strategically along all of those lines. I mentioned that we have a couple different collaborative projects, and I think this is like the forefront of where restoration science needs to go. And I think it's really exciting to be a part of these collaborations. So this is one that we began a couple of years ago. It's led by FWC. Basically, we're working with a consortium of groups from um, Martin County all the way down to Osset Moat in the Lower Keys. And we've outplanted corals, um, the same corals as much as possible, the same genotypes even when, whenever possible and the same species in the same way, six different regions throughout the reef tract in order to see if you outplant corals that are susceptible to stony coral tissue loss disease, like what kind of success are you going to get? What kind of survival rates? Are, is disease just gonna like wipe out your cohort or is it endemic enough in that lower levels that this is actually a viable solution? Um, so we have worked really hard with our partners to provide corals and outplant them within these sites using multiple species provided by multiple in-situ and land-based nurseries um, to really have a strategic way to outplant and monitor the success of these corals. And so far, this is kind of some of our initial results after we've outplanted um, separated by region, looking at number of coral colonies. And the blue represents like no disease, they look healthy. The purple is like something weird's going on, but we're not sure why. And then the kind of tannish is possible stony coral tissue loss disease. And to me, really the take home messages is like, you're not outplanting corals and then they're getting hit by stony coral tissue loss disease. There's some incidences where it's coming up, um, but it's at really low levels because you can see the scale only goes from 160 to 200. So this isn't really capturing the full suite of the scale. So we're actually honing in on just the top to get some visual differences, which su su suggests that this disease is, is going to be something we have to deal with, but isn't going to like be prohibitive to a lot of our efforts, at least not right now. But what we did see was that there was a huge amount of fin fish predation on the corals that we put out there. So one of the major hurdles that we're having to deal with, especially in some of those middle regions, is that the corals are getting hammered by fish as soon as you get out, as soon as they get outplanted there. 
And that's where a lot of our work with um, Dr. Altieri is coming in is to like figure out how do we mitigate these, these kind of surprising finfish predation events so that the corals don't get like slammed with predation as soon as they get out there and then have to spend the next several months like recovering from all of that. So it's really led to some really nice large scale important data that's sort of leading to like next projects and next priorities. And then finally, I just wanna share with you a new project that we have going on. This is focused on looking at how to outplant corals kind of at the smallest size as possible. So we're really interested in getting corals out there. It's cheaper to get corals out onto the reef and have the reef take care of them than it is for somebody on land to take care of them in a land-based nursery or even in an in-situ nursery. So this is a collaboration led by University of Miami and the corals that were provided by Florida Aquarium to several of us that are planting them along the Florida reef tract. It's focused on just one species, the Boreal Labyrinth Formies, looking at two different cohorts. So like those that were settled last year and those that were settled two years ago, which obviously can influence their size. We're looking at feeding conditions, like treatments prior to getting them out planted, like should we have them grown in the in-situ nursery or the, or the land-based nursery? Should we feed them? Should we not feed them? And then we're looking at how these corals survive over time. And again, integrating predation monitoring so we can figure out how that plays a role in this type of um, project. So in conclusion, you know, Florida's coral reef is in a very dire situation and coral diseases and bleaching events and climate change has really shaped the current benthic community. And that has to be integrated into any type of forward thinking restoration projects. But the good news is that there are some corals that are more resistant to some of these major threats and we need to figure out what makes them tick and how, how we capitalize off of that. There is currently a lack of evidence for trade-offs associated with some of those resistant traits that we've been measuring, but there's a lot more work to do to look at like fecundity and growth rates and, and other threats that we haven't really prioritized yet. But restoration does has the potential to restore some ecosystem functionings and overcoming some of the bottlenecks that we know exist there and really upscaling the production and looking at how those different ecosystem services come trickling out of the effort is going to be really important in the near term. And these large scale coordinated projects are really going to move the needle forward faster. And I think they're the way that we have to go as a state, as a region to kind of get the reef track back up to hopefully a place that can resemble like an ecosystem that it should be. And then finally, I just wanna introduce you to a couple different initiatives that Moat has started. One is our International Coral Gene Bank. This is a really cool piece of infrastructure that I also manage. It's like a Noah's Ark for coral, coral species preservation and genetic preservation that's in Sarasota. And we have corals in this uh, biobank that are there to kind of be out of the elements and be preserved within a way that they can be used for coral restoration no matter what happens out on the reef tract. And adjacent to the warehouse, we have a spawning room where we have four of these land-based spawning systems. These systems mimic temperature, sunlight, and moonlight to get corals to spawn so that we have a novel source of new genotypes and new babies to put into our restoration plans basically throughout the year. So I really like this initiative that we've got going on. We're also a major partner within Mission Iconic Reefs. So this is a NOAA-led initiative that is estimated to cost $100 million and will take at least 20 years to accomplish to bring these seven iconic reefs back to 25% coral cover, which is what they kind of should be if we weren't in the state we, were, we are in today. And then finally, we are, although we do work with Mission Iconic Reefs in those seven locations, we actually outplant to about 90 different sites. Tracked. Um, mainly where we started was the lower keys. We'll have moved into the upper keys and we'll be establishing a nursery probably in the middle keys within the next few years so that we have a large scale geographic impact on the work that we're doing. And finally, this is kind of what I covered today. So there is a ton that goes into restoration, I'm trying to integrate resilience into the process through genetic diversity, screening for kind of resistant traits, getting corals large enough to spawn, asexual fragmentation and outplanting. 
And one of the things that I love about Moat is that we have kind of players in all of this cycle. So it's really easy for us to implement things quickly and efficiently. And I think that's really important for us to be able to um, recover Florida's reef to the best state we possibly can within our lifetime. And with that, I will thank you for your time and just acknowledge that there's a lot of people that have put their work and um, their time into all of this that I presented to you today. All right, I'm, I'm happy to jump in the first question. I don't know, Andrew, it looks like you're, I don't know if you're sort of gonna quarterback um, questions or not. Why don't you go ahead, Christine? I'm just getting set up here and um, maybe some online as well, but yeah, go for it. All right, Aaron, thanks a lot. That was a really just exciting to see so much, um, so many different aspects of this restoration effort kind of underway. Um, a question that I have is about sort of the direction that you're seeing uh, restoration maybe going related to like multi-trophic restoration and um, just what your thoughts are about the viability of that and where that fits into sort of, you know, say the trajectory of your, the moat program in the years to come. Yeah, we actually just hired on um, a postdoc that is um, focusing on rearing Mithrix crabs, which are the grazing crabs that, um, you know, can be functionally similar to like diadema and the urchins. And so a lot of his uh, PhD focused on how to integrate that into restoration practices. And I think that's going to be incredibly important. We have to grow corals to be probably a year old before we feel like we can outplant them and have them survive because of the interactions that they're going to have with things like algae and sediments. And that is a huge bottleneck. Like we need to be able to get corals out there when they're tiny. We need those corals to be able to settle onto the reef substrate. And I think integrating things like grazers or habitat reclamation, even physically, is going to be really critical in order to like have a large geographical imprint on the reef tract when you're doing restoration. So Aaron, I just want to say um, thanks again. That was, a, that was a wonderful talk and just an amazing overview of um, all the activity that you've been leading there. Um, so it's really impressive. Um, I'm just kind of curious. Um, I mean, I think I, I see the Keith as really being this engine for kind of innovation and research. And you know, a lot of that's led by Mo. Um, and you've kind of showcased the challenges and the opportunities in the Keith. I'm just curious how you see um, the work that's being done there kind of fitting into kind of like more of a global context. I mean, there was some work that came out some years ago that really kind of tried to compare and contrast say Caribbean versus Pacific reefs and how they're, you know, maybe the dynamics or the, some of the mechanisms were different. I'm just curious how you sort of seen some of the work that you've done kind of um, taken up or maybe contrasted in, in like other regions of the world where reefs are, you know, facing, you know, perhaps different challenges. Are you speaking specifically on the resilience work or the others? I, I'm sorry, I have a hard time hearing you. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. That was And that was just sort of like a very general kind of shotgun question. But just, I think you did a really nice job showcasing all the work that you've done in the Keys. And, um, and with good reason, because there's so much need there and there's a lot of opportunity. And I'm curious how you see perhaps um, some of that work, you know, perhaps being um, applied. Mm -hmm. in, um, in other parts of the world and maybe how it may need to be adapted because challenges are just a little, or the systems are just a little bit different, I guess. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think every location is going to have different types of challenges. Anything from like infrastructure capacity to, you know, like dynamics that are happening on the reef that are very different than what we see in the Keys. So, I mean, what we do right now is we try to share, you know, our lessons learned and our what we, what we know works for us to places around the world. So we host workshops in person and we also do virtual workshops and videos to try to share the knowledge, but definitely will be, you know, every, every group that tries to do restoration within their like backyards basically is going to have different challenges than what we have. And so having flexibility and, you know, understanding that what works for us may not work for them, I think is going to be incredibly important, but hopefully a lot of the like initial lessons learned about 
just how to grow corals well, how to outplant them onto the reef. I mean, I think a lot of that can be translatable. Things to think about like what may, everybody's major issues are, whether it's predation or disease or bleaching. I mean, those are gonna be very site specific, I think. And it will take a global effort to try to figure that out on each local scale. Yeah, Mark, looks like you have a question. Oh, thanks. Um, Aaron, amazing, um, amazing presentation, amazing work that you and Mode is doing down there. It's, uh, it's really encouraging to see what sort of successes you have and, and that there is, um, I'll, I'll say hope um, for the future. Um, my question is, and I was down in the Keys, did some work there in the early 90s, and you know, there were a lot of environmental stressors related to water quality and literally physical impacts on the reef. And I think, you know, at least the physical ones are, are essentially being minimized because of protection under the sanctuary, but I'm curious, even though we have emerging stressors that are associated with um, climate change and whatnot, what do you feel like it, um, these, some of these historic uh, stressors that probably have led to declines in oyster reefs, are they being, have they been dealt with adequately, do you think, as we kind of emerge to isolating new genotypes that might address future ones, or are we, are we setting ourselves up for kind of a repeated um, hit by, uh, you know, some of these stressors that maybe haven't been dealt with quite yet, um, if that all makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think there's pervasive water quality issues that we have the capacity to deal with and control on a local level that, I mean, I, I definitely um, see some of that moving forward. Um, you know, in the Keys, everybody got off septic and got off of you know, got off of their individual septic systems and now in, are centralized, which I think is a step forward. Um, but there's a ton more that needs to be done that really hasn't been done yet. Um, but I think we have to, you know, move forward and learn and deal with it. Because like, frankly, if we wait for things to get, we're not going to have anything left. Um, so, you know, we've got to work with our managers, prioritize how the government is spending their money to hopefully care, clean up a lot of the local issues and just like beat the drum that local, like dealing with local issues helps corals, particularly deal with global issues much better. So let's like take care of our home, you know, first and foremost. Um, I think that there are the positive sign of something like stony coral tissue loss disease, the fact that it came out of kind of nowhere in the middle of a really metropolitan area has brought a ton of like vision on water quality because it was either probably related to some untreated sewage in the area, you know, a dredging event that was happening nearby the combination of the two or even potentially, you know, climate change with the addition of the two, but like there has been laser focus on water quality because of that. And as devastating as the disease outbreak has been, I mean, at least it's starting to funnel money into hopefully cleaning up some of South Florida, because I think that is a huge priority for restoration to be successful, and especially in that area. The key is I think we're a little bit out of the major issues that like South Florida has, but obviously we still get, you know, impacts from the local community and whatever's getting brought to us from South Florida. So I, I think it's a point we have to like beat that drum at the same time as we're, you know, figuring out how to do what we need to do to preserve what we have left in the meantime. Cool. Thanks again and keep up the amazing work. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question from here in the class. Yeah, Hunter. Is there any compromise um, between growth and resistance to bleaching disease? So, so we haven't, yeah. So we we haven't seen anything yet. Um, we uh, let me think. We have some some new data on one of our boulder corals at. I think it does suggest that maybe some of those are more slow growing, that are more heat tolerant. But what's interesting is those corals also have the algal symbiont duristinium, 
And Durastinium is more heat tolerant. So symbionts play a really important role probably in the like heat tolerance of some of those boulder corals like mountainous star coral, the Orbicella fibulata. And it's known that those corals that harbor Durastinium may grow slower. So I think there's going to be some probably, you know, implications of growth and survival that we're going to have to tease apart in some of these other species that we're just getting some of the data on. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, Mary, I just wondered too, if you might just speak briefly about um, some of like the engagement or, or um, involvement with like kind of um, the non-scientific community, like in the Keys and in, you know, South Florida and, and closer to Sarasota, just in some of these efforts that you talked about, like, um, yeah, in both the science, but especially, I guess, the restoration, like how's it being received? What level of support and from what sectors and any surprises there? Yeah, I mean, originally, I would say like for the first seven years of our restoration activities, all of our support came from philanthropy because I think nobody thought it was really viable to do something like this under current conditions. So we really had to prove ourselves for a really long time now that we have you know, the data to show that we can make some things work for sure. Um, we're getting some funding from the federal government and also the state of Florida as well as like competitive grants um, like National Science Foundation and NOAA and things like that. So we've been able to diversify once we actually like put the legwork in to show that what we thought was possible is, you know, becoming possible. Um, and then I think you were asking about like outreach and communication maybe. So like we, we have a whole education team at Sarasota and a lot of our work, a lot of their work focuses on translating a lot of our corals to, you know, we call it from K to gray. So anything from kindergarten to seniors. So they have like a really extensive program, but what we've been really working on kind of lately is give opportunities to community members or even visitors to be able to do coral restoration. So we've partnered with um, a couple different dive shops in the Keys, um, some youth led organizations throughout Florida and I Care, which is a community-based nonprofit in Isla Mirada. And those efforts focus on getting um, anybody who wants to that can scuba dive, you know, the ability to get out into our nurseries, help us maintain those nurseries, and then physically outplant corals so that we can get, you know, not only the community engagement and buy-in, but um, you know, we can that can also push our needle forward quicker by having those groups help us along in the effort. And so that ne wasn't necessarily an easy thing to try to figure out how to do effectively because it's kind of diff difficult on multiple levels, but I'm super happy with like, if you, any of you wanted to go dive and outplant moat squirrels, you can do it now. You can go to Isla Mirada and, and get out there. And so that's like exactly what I think needs to happen. Yeah, great. I think that's really nice to hear because uh, just thinking about scaling up, Efforts and obviously there's some trade-offs and some extra investment on on Moat's part, but um, it's really neat to kind of think how you know to, to sort of reflect on how you guys have creatively, you know, done that engagement um, and getting people involved. It's really neat because it's a challenge. I've thought about that my own work, like how do you get people, you know, out on the water in the water, and it's very different than you know planting, you know, perhaps putting plants on a on a on a seashore or um, working like in a forest or kind of field type setting. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and our, I mean, we have our land-based nursery on Summerlin too, which gives, I mean, it's a great outreach tool because you can like, you don't have to get in the water to actually engage with corals. But so there's a lot of coral like husbandry that we rely on interns and volunteers to help us with, but there's only so much like algae scrubbing people want to do. They want to get in the water and outplant the corals, you know? So it's like great that we can finally do that. Yeah. Um, any other questions out there? I don't. I don't have access to the YouTube um, chat. No, no, YouTube's okay. shy today. No YouTube okay. questions. <laughs> Anything else from the class? Got one more question. Yeah, Rebecca. Um, so, would information about internships and volunteering for those land-based nurseries be available on the main uh, the main website? Yep. If you just go to moat.org, we have a education tab with internships and we have 
a lot of different internship types that I rec recommend you all look at and look for. And we have internship programs that happen year round. Um, and we love our interns. And I actually think one of our former interns, Haley Vaughn, is on today. So, yes. So we like to get people in and um, hopefully see those applications come into our portal. Thank you. Good question. Thanks. All right. Anything else?